In this remarkable world we live, we stand amazed at the grandeur of creation. We open our eyes and are amazed. We find creative design, but we also find chaos. How do these things coexist? Is one perceived and the other real? If so, what is true? For what are we all yearning? Hello and welcome to What is True. My name is Dennis Kara, the host of this program, and it's a privilege that we can have this time of studying God's Word together. Uh, the times that we've had together, this previous uh, series on the nature of faith, the response to that, and uh, the teaching that has gone on, we are so happy the the the, the reception. And that is available on our YouTube channel. And uh, if you can, you know, you can go to What is True with Dennis Carroll and Don Patton uh, and key it into the YouTube search. You'll find us and you can watch that entire series. We've got a couple of social issues that we want to talk about. They translate into our lives on a daily basis and also just in a structure of a local church, but really the interaction of mankind uh, as gender roles are distinct. And the gender roles in the Bible help us understand uh, truly we un there is a distinction. I think we all know about the distinction. But when we come to in a religious perspective, men and women uh, are one in Christ, but we are distinct in our roles and our responsibilities. And so with that in mind, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, we're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And that there is no male nor female is not referring to the elimination of gender in humanity, not the elimination of gender within humanity. It is the gender distinction in this world while recognizing the unity that we have spiritually with Jesus Christ. But there is a distinction between the responsibilities. And as individuals, we are all united in Christ. We're equal in importance. We're equal in access uh, to God, members of his church. But as members with equal status, it, it doesn't mean that we have the same function or responsibility. And really when we're talking about this, what we're talking about is function and responsibility. These two things that will help us realize that our roles are unique. There is a universal law in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 34, let your women keep silent in the churches for I, they are not permitted to speak, but that they are in submissive or let them be submissive as the law also says. So we have a universal law and we want to look at that as we try to understand the distinction of roles and responsibilities. For we see that in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16 that you have a statement there that makes he shall rule over you. And with that being said, that presents a bit of a problem, doesn't it? He shall rule over me. Does that mean that we now have these oppressive relationships in which that a man has the right to abuse, dominate? The universal law is this. It is the import of a law that is substantiated by the instruction given to man to be responsible as the head of the house. The woman recognizes the support and supports his role. The import of this law is substantiated by instruction given to man to be responsible. When we say, as the law also says, and we're talking about a role distinction, we are actually stating that there is a law that God has established that man must accept. Sacrificial love. Ephesians 5, 25, in the sweat of your brow, in the sweat of your brow, you will labor. Now, this is the man working. Then we have in the statement made in regard to 1 Timothy 5 and 10 and 14, childbearing, the desire toward her husband, and 
he shall rule. And then she is managing the house. So we have a very clear picture of one ruling, one managing. And how that this is going to work together will be seen in the recognition, first of all, that there is a distinction, one in Christ, but distinct in roles and responsibilities. There is a distinction in roles and responsibilities. And this is true throughout our culture. However, there are some efforts that we engage in in our discussion that oftentimes become misunderstood. And I want to make it very plain here that this subject is not simply about those who should submit and refuse, but is equally shared by those who ought to lead and will not. And I would say that the application of leadership properly brings about the willful working together of others. It's, it's not just submission that brings strife, but leadership as well. Just as we sin willfully when we refuse to submit as we should to a circumstance that we should be working within, then we sinfully refuse to take responsibility as we should, and there is the same thing. The problem, the husband must accept headship. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So the husband ought to love his own wife as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, and no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. So it's this self-esteem issue. Well, not arrogant. What we're talking about is the willingness to step up and accept the responsibility. And in the same way, we have a wife recognizing the role of her husband. And that's the context that we find in Ephesians chapter 5, 22 and 23. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for husband is the head of the wife. Oh, there it is again. No, listen, the husband is responsible to care, provide, lead, help as the wife helps. We'll see how that continues to work. And then all of us, if you read Ephesians 5 and you know that passage and how we use it, and my wife becomes a little tired because I quote Ephesians 5 when it applies to her, not reading my part. Ephesians 5, though, when we see in verse 21, submit to one another in the fear of God. Now, this is an action of free agency. This is, a, a, it describes voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, assuming responsibility, and carrying a burden. Carrying a burden. Now, don't think about that. Now, we're saying responsibility, and we are saying carrying a burden. Submission. Now, is that a bad thing? Submission is not discrimination. When we talk about submission, this is, the, I think, the, the, where the rub might come. It, it's not talking about discrimination in any respect. It's talking about order so things can be performed or done in appropriate manner. But when you look at that in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 through 17, and Romans 16, verses 1 through 6, where the operation of the church or the functioning of the church is going on, uh, what you have in that is simply that those that are working together, and, and he gives us a description. I'm glad at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunaeus and Achaia for what was lacking on your part they supplied. These were men who were making sacrifices were they leading or were they submitting? Well, both. And we're going to see that also in how that sometimes submission becomes leadership. Not, not in the sense of usurping authority, changing roles, or having to switch hats. We're just talking about how that God has designed it so that these things can work out and work together. Romans 16, 1 through 6, we'll also talk about because there you have individuals, women, men working together in the function and the work of the church. But submission is not discrimination. In 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7, that entire dialogue about a wife being submissive to her husband 
to those who do not obey the word, that they, without a word, might be won by the chaste conduct of their wives. Now, what happens? They're being submissive, but what are they doing? Leading. The husband is being disobedient by her disposition, this spirit that she possesses. She's winning her husband. She's leading him to Jesus. So, we must quickly move. This is a pretty exhaustive lesson for a short period of time. New Testament application of Genesis 2 and 3 in regard to the established order. Because we have in 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35, let your women keep silent in the churches for we are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's shameful to a woman to speak in church. So have we suddenly suspended a woman's ability to sing or to pray? No, what he's saying is there's three times mentioned, and that was if there's no interpreter present, if there's no interpreter present in verse 28 of 1 Corinthians 14, when it's giving the dialogue, if there's no interpreter present, the uh, gifted tongue speaker must be quiet. This is the, when the tongues existed in the first century, these miraculous spiritual gifts, even they had to be controlled. Another speaking, somebody else talking, hold your peace. And then we have in verse 34 through 35, women keep silent. This is talking about order within the church. And it's not just to women. It's talking about even to an individual that would be gifted with a miraculous spiritual gift, but there was no interpreter to be quiet. It doesn't imply a woman cannot worship God in song, nor does it imply that a woman cannot confess her sins to Christ and, and confess Jesus Christ. What we learn is every woman praying or prophesying 1 Corinthians 11, 5. With her head uncovered, that's reflecting a uh, rejection of authority. And then in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, let your women keep silent in the churches. Situational silence. We've got two passages here, and so we have to ask the question, is one or the other every woman praying or prophesying, or we have women who are to keep silent? Are they praying and prophesying, or are they to keep silent? And here is an explanation that will help us all. Take this full screen for just a second, Steve, if you can. And that is not until chapter 11, verse 18, does Paul address coming together as a church. The Lord's Supper, the regulation of speaking in tongues, including women speaking, the collection for the saints. In this reflection, there was this regulation, and in the church, there is this distinction. So what we have here, each command to keep silent, even to the men of 1 Corinthians 14, 28 and 30, as well as to the women, connected to the idea of public discourse. You can let me come back now. When you come together as the church, 1 Corinthians 11, 18. Whenever you come together, 1 Corinthians 14, 26. This is a distinctive aspect of situational silence in which we understand a principle. And the principle must prevail and the direct statements must prevail. You can make all the cultural applications that you wish, but that does not suffice to the application in this culture of this teaching. Let a woman learn in silent and all submissive, and do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over the man, but be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Eve was not deceived, but the Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. That's 1 Timothy chapter 11 and verses 11 through 15. That text, let a woman quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. Now listen, on this restriction, this silence or the quietly is, is, is uh, hesu ne, hosu kine. That is in silence, quietly. Look at the principles that are contained. To be in silence, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12, as we walk through this. It's a different word than in 1 Corinthians 14 and 
can mean peaceable, quietness, keep silent because others wanted to speak, as in Corinth. <clears throat> but the purpose was to recognize God's authority. The purpose was to recognize God's authority. We'll continue in regard to the distinction. Let deacons be the husband of one wife. And since we're talking about this and there's this issue of deaconesses uh, that is before us at times, let the deacons be a husband of one wife. Now there is an office in which an individual must meet a qualification. The extent of the regulation within the scriptures regarding a woman, a woman prayed, prophesied, taught in some situations. The context of 1 Timothy 2.12 pertains to the role of women in the church shows they did not take leading roles in praying, teaching over the men in gender mixed assemblies. There's the extent of the regulation. 1 Timothy 11, 12. And let me tell you this. My wife is a much better Christian than I am, more knowledgeable. And I've got women that I could line up here that could embarrass me with, with their knowledge of the Bible compared to mine. We're not talking about superiority in any respect. Women are to teach. Older women likewise admonish the young women. Women are to teach and to sing. All of these things. And Priscilla was involved in teaching. And when Aquila Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So, each one of these provides for us that women teach. Women teach as we sing. Priscilla was involved in teaching. But none of these took authority over the man in that situation because the roles are distinct. The shepherds, the elders of a congregation, husband, I mean, they are to be the husband of one wife. How can we suspend culturally anything? You can't suspend culturally the husband and wife or man and woman. Those genders are there and that's what's the problem, trying to make that. So the enduring principle of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 through 16 is this, and, and there again, pull me out so I can walk through this a little bit. Thanks. God ordained an order of authority. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman and the head of woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. Every woman praying or prophesying with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. A woman could use talents, gifts in some settings, but honor must be given to God's established order. Now let's try to understand that. Regard must be given to any custom or culture. There's a covering that reflects one's subjection to God's order. And then, failure to acknowledge their role caused the angels to be cast down. There's your context of verse 10. Let me read it for you. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Failure to acknowledge their role caused angels to be cast down. Thus, we must accept and place, uh, the, accept the place and role God has created for us because of the angels. And that, what he's saying, that not because of angels, but because of the, what we learn from the angels who did not respect God's authority, the recognition of their role. Now, this next text, this next passage is so critical because we need to get together on this. This is not something, this issue isn't something that we should have uh, even gender warfare or even warfare in our, our churches. Because this is how we work together. And what we're describing here is the role and responsibility distinction. If you don't have it, you're going to have chaos. So take me out again. Let's read this slow. Man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor is man created for the woman, but woman for the man. 
Nevertheless, neither is man independent of the woman, nor woman independent of the man. In the Lord. In the Lord. For as, when we're in God's design, for as woman came from man, even so man comes through woman. But all things are of God. We're not independent. There's not some race superiority that's going on here. We are one in Christ. We are distinct in our roles and responsibilities. One in Christ and distinct in our roles and responsibilities. This is what is true in regard to understanding who we are and where we are in Jesus Christ. When we profess that we have faith in Jesus, then we must come to this place in which that we are submissive. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. And it looks like this. Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel, as being heirs together in the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Men must take the role. And we live in a society that has caused many tragedies. And I want to say this about the things that we have discussed. When we enter into our relationships, man and woman, and we begin to say things in regard to our existence or our attitude toward gender, I don't need him. I don't need her. Oftentimes those are the words that you hear when there is things going wrong. That can be in a family, that can be in a church. And we are faced with a crisis in our country. It's not new and we will address it in our next study. It has to do with identity crisis. But we're talking about this for gender roles for men and women and that and the performance of it. But listen to what would have happened to our children. If we begin to say to one gender or another, I say, I don't need her anymore. I don't need a woman. And I have a son or I have a daughter. And my daughter hears me making that statement regarding that and her knowing that she will be there, what kind of identity crisis might I be creating in her mind? And so this subject and the importance of recognizing this authority, when we say this authority that comes from God, this distinction in role, to whatever extent that we should go to to make sure that we are exhibiting before others our willingness to be in that role. And yes, sometimes that role becomes incredibly difficult. And there are many circumstances that uh, require sitting down and working through, identifying the roles and trying to make sure that each individual is engaging in the roles that God has designed. When that occurs, then we have the working relationship of a family. Now next week, we're going to talk about that identity crisis as we discuss homosexuality as it is setting before us today. And how can we help those that are trapped in that great deception of a lifestyle that would forever separate them from God. These two lessons are going to be available to you and if we can make any of this information. Go to What is True with Dennis Caro. Type it into your YouTube search engine and you'll be able to locate this lesson and share it with others. 
the next lesson next week will also be very critical to the things that we're facing in our day. Thank you so much for joining me for today's program. We hope it's a blessing to you. We pray it is. So many have contacted us. We're thankful. You can reach me at what is true at att.net. You can call me. That is my direct line. I will answer the phone if you need to talk. Thank you so much. Have a blessed day. I lift my eyes unto the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the Maker. Of heaven and earth. I lift my eyes unto the hills. Where does my help come from? I'll praise you in this storm, and I will lift my hands. You are who you are, no matter where I am, and every tear I cry. I will praise you in this storm.